Hi, this is Janaid, neurocritical care stroke and epilepsy specialist. We're going to continue with our course, Decide Wisely, a guide to choosing a medical specialty, especially in this post-pandemic digital healthcare era. We're going to talk about in this module mainly financial considerations. It's extremely important and sometimes less talked about subject, but I wanted to bring to attention that this is a very important, crucial consideration when you're choosing your medical specialty. In the last two modules, we discussed how changes change, how I, we moved from logarithmic to algorithmic change. Then we talked about work-life balance as a whole sort of section in which we discussed lifestyle consideration because that's the key thing. Finances are secondary to lifestyle considerations. So it's very important that you remember what the teachings in that sort of lectures and then come back to this one of just financial considerations. In this particular lecture, it's going to seem like a different amalgamation of different topics and therefore it's going to seem sometimes a little bit of disconnected. The idea behind is that you can actually connect these dots and then understand sort of a financial picture of both healthcare on a global and US perspective and then understand how it applies to you individually. So let's start with the individual situation. So first understanding the phases of your financial life is extremely important. You know, when you are in your medical school and you're getting your degree and everything and training, this is where you're basically accumulating there. That's your primary growth, but you're not actually having any income. You're not having any income source. What you're doing is you're actually accumulating a set of skills and that's where you actually accumulate debt. The second phase is always debt repayment because that's one of the key things that people, student loans, etc., that we have to do a repayment sort of structure in those cases. The third phase is asset building where there is a secondary growth. When you are actually looking into different areas there you can do asset building in terms of stocks, 401ks, rental properties, whatever that asset building phase comes in. And then lastly, your concentration changes completely to making sure that you have enough retirement income and possibly if you're smart enough you can go into to passive income as well while you're producing those assets. So that's your financial journey overall. That's no different for any other person. It's the same journey I'm going through and probably one of the few peoples except for who are ultra rich may not need this. But generally speaking, this is where most people fall in terms of their financial journey. Now, the other personal thing is like, you know, how much physicians do make is something that I'm going to teach you here or sort of at least give you the skills how to figure it out on an ongoing basis because things are going to change significantly as we move along. But how much is enough? And that's not a question that I can answer. But I do want to answer one thing is that that do invest in your happiness. Now, this is a fantastic lecture and I've follow this person very much on YouTube and he did this great lecture on how to invest in your happiness to understand how much is enough and to understand where to put the money in in terms of a long-term happiness sort of way. He quoted this study in his particular lecture and what he said is that that satiation, a turning point at which happiness is more than the income is around 95,000. This is a little older study, I think 2018. I think the numbers would be slightly higher, especially now that inflation is rampant. However, there is a number at which you do have more happiness. If you go more than that, your happiness declines if your income goes up. So make sure that you find that balance in your life because it's important that you are also happy. So important thing as I'm trying to say here is that not just concentrate on the absolute numbers make sure that relative happiness is also very important indicator of your enjoying your specialty as well because if you're going to work too hard great you're going to make some money but at the end of the day you're going to feel burned out you're going to feel like you're in a cage and those are the things that you should be very very mindful of as compared to other specialties i mean the divorce rate among surgeons is higher there's a reason for it right so we need to make sure that in the lifestyle consideration you take that into account happiness investing in happiness you take that into account and then we move to where we can consider some of the data for physicians one thing that i personally made a mistake and i would really want to make sure that you understand that there's a term called golden handcuffs the idea is that the minute you actually start making money your lifestyle creeps up and once your lifestyle creeps up your monthly expenses go high and when your monthly goes expenses go high you feel trapped within that lifestyle creep so make sure that you always plan for that when you start making money you plan it in a way that your lifestyle stays stable and you're building assets not just spending money 
So what is the average annual income of physicians? So what is their annual physician compensation is concerned? This is an excellent chart. We, all this is from Medscape. This is also referenced within the website. So you can see it clearly when you are going through the Academy website. So as you can see, plastic surgery is the highest. Then we have orthopedic surgery, and then we have cardiology, urology, etc. Over here, you can see that critical care, emergency medicine, and pulmonary medicine, which are inpatient specialties. And we're going to come to what is going to be the impact of inpatient and what is the future of hospitals in the upcoming series but those are the kind of specialties that were highly paid because they are taking care of acute cases and they are taking care of inpatient patients however this is going to change as we move forward clearly because of artificial intelligence that's what we're going to discuss advanced practice providers again virtual care environment and in general the overall financial changes in the healthcare industry even that was started before pandemic is going to is accelerated by post pandemic so again this is sort of an area where you should start like what is your annual physician compensation in your choice of subspecialty and then go from there Income changes every year, and that's reported again in the Medscape. As you can see, plastic surgery went up by 10%, oncology went up by 7%, neurology, psychiatry, and clinical care is about 4%. So you see some changes on an year to year basis that doesn't define, but what it tells you is the overall trend. If you look, go back and see the whole data, you can see which subspecialties are changing within their overall compensation packages. Now, Unfortunately, and that's I'm going to be very honest with you, generalists are paid less than specialists. And I mean, there's some truth to it. There's some special training, more fellowships to go. I went through two fellowships. I think I should get more paid. But that's not the key. The key is that there is a significant difference. And it's unfortunate, to be honest with you, because if you look at other countries around the world, this is all U.S. data, that this difference is there, but it's not that significant. So unfortunately, I think in some areas, this is going to get broader and some areas is going to get less. However, with the advent of value-based care, again, we're going to discuss that in the upcoming lectures, we're seeing that generalist pay is getting more and more. What is generalist subspecialties? This is internal medicine, family medicine, and pediatrics. Every other subspecialty is not considered primary care. Like as neurologists, we want to call, you know, multiple sclerosis patients. We take care of everything, right? But we are not considered primary physicians, generalists, etc. We are considered specialists. So at the end of the day, from a book perspective, from the insurance company perspective, a neurologist is always a specialist. Anyways, what I'm saying is that a specialist gets a little higher pay, not a little higher pay, reasonably a higher pay. And if that's one of your considerations to make sure that you take that into consideration when you're making a choice of your specialty. Who are the physicians who feel, especially in the United States, they are fairly compensated? Oncology, psychiatry, plastic surgery, dermatology. These are higher people that feel the most satisfied as far as their compensation is concerned. Again, it's different from different people. This is amalgamation of academic, non-academic, private practice, everything. But as you can see, there are people who feel like they're fairly compensated and those who do not. This is, again, important consideration when you're taking into account what your choice of subspecialty should be. The top five specialties most in demand is family medicine and internal medicine. Even though that they are actually paid at a lower rate, they are always in a higher demand because there's always need for more primary generalist physicians at all times. So it's important that you always plan for that in terms of, you know, if you want to be always in demand. And then if you are going to be in an area where you're going to be in a very high, dense metro area where there's theater, dining, everything, and you want to be in a specialty that you want to be able to compete, those are the choices you have to make that what are the places and what are the subspecialties that you're most in demand again this is 2020 data this may change again as you move forward you have to keep updating your own sort of cycle and see that overall trend as well but generally speaking these subspecialties that are listed here are always in demand and it's always hard to find these physicians i'm personally struggling with psychiatry you know it's just hard for sometimes to actually find physicians in that particular subspecialties in telemedicine specifically, as you said, psychiatry, radiology, family medicine, pediatrics, and internal medicine is highly in demand as well. The metro areas in the United States is El Paso, Miami, Florida, Cleveland, Ohio, Phoenix, Arizona, and Denver, Colorado. Again, you can see that these things are going to change as we move forward. There's a high push, and sometimes there are places that actually open up sign-on bonuses, special packages, etc., and then things change but at the end of the day these are currently the metro areas where you can see most in demand again you should see where you're going to fall on the spectrum as well it's always a demand and supply thing right i mean i'm living in dallas texas there's not a significant shortage of neurologists so there's a competitive market that i'm living in but if i move to el paso texas 
it's going to be a different people will be lining up so there's a difference where you're going to be ending up as far as your location preference is concerned and you should take that into account again it should not be too much when you're talking about your choice but it should be taken into consideration so the best place to go is at the Salary Explorer at the Medscape. It is a fantastic place where you get all the information in one place. Unfortunately, it does not divide between academic and non-academic, which is a huge gap in itself. But at the end of the day, at least it gives you a sort of a earmark of what things have been, how things are changing, what is the national average, is it going up, going down, what is comparative to different subspecialties. So you can search up all these things in your own time when you are you know, making these considerations when choosing your medical specialty. Specialty. Again, grateful for your time. Make sure you go to the website for a direct link to all these resources. Thank you. If you save a life, it is as if you save the life of mankind. Please make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe to my YouTube channel and my newsletter. If you want to get in touch with me, the best way is to go to Twitter or via LinkedIn. Also, make sure you follow the Academy website for regular updates. Thank you so much.